Welcome to the Growth Enablement Madness Podcast, and I'm Jim Ward, your host, CEO of BrainCell, the growth enablement company. I'm absolutely mad about helping businesses grow and scale. And in this podcast, my team and I get a chance to talk shop with industry thought leaders about a variety of growth enablement strategies, stories, and technology trends. I'm happy that you're here, so let's get the growth conversation started. Hey, welcome everybody back to the Growth Enablement Podcast. Looking forward to uh, having our conversation today with a terrific guest. But before I introduce that guest, I want to thank my, what do, I, what do I call you guys? You're my cohorts, you're my colleagues, you're my... Minions. Yeah, oh, I, that's I like cute. Minions. Yeah, well, okay, Minion Allie. Allie Lipman, introduce yourself, please. Hey, folks, I am Allie Lipman. I'm an account executive of customer experience technology here at BrainCell and one of the minions here on Growth Enablement Madness. I refer to her as a rock star. And Brian Anderson, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Brian. I am the content guru here at BrainCell. I make sure that Jim doesn't say anything too stupid. (laughs) That's uh, very hard to do. And I want to thank both of Allie and uh, Brian and our whole team. We just finished the year out, folks. And uh, what we do is we try to eat the uh, dog food that, what is it we say? No, no, we drink the champagne. Champagne, yeah. Right, because uh, we were able to accomplish terrific growth this year. And we're utilizing a lot of the things that we talked to you about in this podcast. So we really are the folks that uh, go to test it. We beta test it and then we bring it to market. And that may be services, it may be technology, it may be a combination. So um, that's what we do. We're crazy about growing companies and helping companies scale. Today's guest is one of our clients, a very, very successful client we've worked with. His name is Jeff Bome. Jeff Bome is, I say, I said co-CEO of Club Colors. Is that right, Jeff? Jeff, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about the company, if you could start there. Sure. I'm co-CEO of Club Colors. Club Colors is a branding marketing company here in Chicago, uh, Chicago area. We're actually in Schaumburg, Illinois. Been with this business since 2009 and gone through plenty of stuff here for the last seven years have been co-CEO with my business partner, Chris Tassi, and also experienced really terrific results this last year. And Coming out of COVID really had some, the whole pandemic thing, business dropped significantly immediately, but we were able to make a good recovery and we feel confident about the future. That's great. I'm happy for you. Before I uh, ask the next question, I was just curious, what was the things that you did that allowed you to turn things around? That's a very long story. I, I heard you say a few minutes ago, this is a 20 minute podcast. So the, the <laughs> short answer to that is to not forget we are and what our core business is. And a lot of folks in our industry tended to go off and chase shiny things. And there was a lot of survival mode there. We took a different tact and really focused on what we call, we created a graphic. It's a tree with roots, right? So you see the ground and then the roots underneath the tree above. And it says opportunity grows from the roots of adversity. Basically means grow when it's winter, grow your roots. There's no fruit coming off the tree at the moment, but there's still work to be done. And so we used the pandemic and the things that happened there to grow our core business until things turned around and they've been turning around since then. So we're a stronger business as a result of it and uh, more focused, the team's more energized, all that stuff. That's great stuff. I think a lot of folks who've come through the pandemic and have come through it are stronger because of it. I think all adversity creates strength for us. So we also had that same, we did not skip a beat that last year. We were very lucky that we had data that drove, drove us to pivot. But let me, let me ask you another question. Since we call this growth enablement, we term our company as a growth enablement company. What does growth enablement mean to you? I think it's a great question. And I always, I don't like to brush over things because for us, it's about building a team that is flexible and ready to respond. The one thing we know and was illustrated most acutely during COVID is that you don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow. And so growth enablement is the ability to deal with whatever that is. And I think fundamentally having a team that is emotionally equipped to do that 
is really the critical component there. I don't think outside of that, everything else, it falls apart if you don't have that team that is able to manage the stress. Yeah, agree that agree with you 100%. And I know that you use an outside and you've introduced us to this assessment technology that you were really serious about. Would you mind sharing with the audience what you use to create that sort of team? Yeah, not at all. It's called Culture Index. We have a consultant, Claudine, who is really just guided us through this process. And we were hiring, we had a problem at one point in that we hired an awful lot of really nice people that we like to work with. And that's nice on its on its face. It's nice. But if they're not the right people for the job, if they don't have the right skill set, if they don't have the right mindset, and that doesn't mean, by the way, a person can have whatever mindset they have, you just got to get them into a job that matches it. And so that's what this tool did for us. It has allowed us to understand the way people are wired a little bit better. And they, they agree with it most of the time, right? And, and so we're able to identify people who won't really like sales or who don't really have the makeup to manage orders through a system. There's a lot of different things in there, but it changed everything in the way that we, I mean, we went from just massive turnover to, we still have some turnover where it's club colors is a great place to work. It is not, however, an easy place to work. And it's not our objective to make it an easy place to work. We're a success oriented business. If, if we fail, our clients fail. And you guys are in a similar position, right? So we take this very, very seriously. Somebody's job is on the line for everything we get hired to do <laughs> in most cases, right? So we take it seriously. And getting people who can do that, Culture Index has allowed us to have a just a much, much better hit rate on that. And turned over an entire department this year and have completely upgraded. It's just been spectacular how identifying certain traits in that tool really were an indicator of long-term success. And so we're getting great results from it. You know, it's amazing when folks are successful in their, in their work or their career and they're happy that that brings happiness to clients as well. So it's a circle of life, so to speak, in the business world. So I think you hit the nail on the head. By the way, it's a really interesting thing. I counsel people all the time. You should be in charge of your career. You should be building your career around the things that energize you, that make you excited, that make you happy. If you sit back and wait for somebody to give you work, you're going to get pretty crappy assignments, right? But if you step up and you just go grab the things that you're great at, you're going to be a lot more successful. And so we try to allow people to do that as well. So if there's something you really love doing, you're probably pretty good at it. Right. No, I agree. All right. I want to, we'll probably circle back to some of those other things, but I want to set you up for some of the questions we're going to get into. And so tell us about Club Colors. What, in, in a succinct manner that you can, what do you actually do? What are you selling? What are you doing? So we're selling interactions. It's a, we work, we operate in a space that is very commodity driven. Most of the people who do this are commodity driven. I, every time somebody asks me that question, I wish. I could bring my business partner on. He's so much more eloquent at, at articulating these things. He probably cringes every time I try. But ultimately, we operate in the branding space. So we sell products with logos. And that's the simple answer. Now, everybody does that. You can get it on online for imprint. You know, there's all kinds of places you can get this. What we do is we focus on a personal advisement role. So that most people who are out doing this, they're trying to create a successful event. So that's where we focus. And a successful event isn't getting a blue pen. It's getting the right tool to convey the message that you want. And we have hired and trained a really spectacular group of brand advisors who help people like yourself, who aren't experts in this space to really pull off just spectacular events. And that's what we do. So that's my kind of half-assed way of getting that out. I'll send you a clip of Chris saying it later and you'll be like, wow, that was so much better. No, but I think I get in the fire to summarize what you really do. And that's differentiator from the Vista Prince or whoever else are out there. You know, when I, we go in there, we, we're looking for something and you get a logo, you put it on something, but we have no idea really if it's going to create any result. 
And I think like us, we're an outcome-based company. We want outcomes for our clients. You are actually thinking about when you put together whatever the branded item is, that there's a result that's been thought about. It's deliberate. And I often think about that when we buy tchotchkes and I'm thinking, well, really, what are, we, what are we doing? What are we you know, doing with this? Why am yeah. I spending money on this? Right. I love this story. We had a, and it's a short one. We had a $70,000 umbrella order for a big client. And we presented a product and they said it was too expensive. And they showed one of our competitors who had showed them another product. And we said, we won't sell you that product. We know what your event is, we know how it went. And so we lost the order initially. And then they got the product and they called us back and they said, okay, we're going to go with this. I don't know if they paid for it twice, but ultimately we got the order and we built that client with They're probably 10 times the size of customer they were then because we turned down an order that because it wasn't the right product for them. We said, well, we're, we can't provide that. We know that's not the right product for you. And so that's what advisement means. Advisement means and we, by the way, we don't turn down every order. It was just like, no, with this, we, oh, this is, people have budgets. It's not always the right product, right? If the more expensive product isn't always the right product and you have to know when to cut that and when not to. We all have budgets, but what we're really looking for is some sort of outcome and a return on investment. And that's the void that when I, when Sonia, if I think is your account executive has worked with you and I looked at what your company did, I thought that's the missing piece in branded materials is the thoughtful part of how is this going to advance the relationship for the client's clients, right? So I think it's terrific. And what a great opportunity we had during COVID when all these schools shut down. We do a lot of business on college campuses. All these schools shut down and didn't know how to connect with their student body. Our business took off by solving that problem for them. And so that kind of thing, when nobody knows what to do, we've got years on 600 campuses and we're figuring it out. That's awesome. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to bring us back. So one of the things that you and I have talked about in the past, we're an EOS company, meaning that we follow traction. It's by Gino Wickman and he's a disciple of scaling up. And I think you use something about you've implemented scaling up. Can you talk about how that has helped you to scale the business? And maybe a little bit about what it is scaling up is. Scaling up as Vern Harnish, it's essentially the same thing. It's the one page strategic plan is what the output of this whole process is. And it's a way of really exercising disciplines on your own management. So we struggled probably one of the fundamental things that we struggled with as a management team, Chris and myself in particular, was every day we had a new idea. And you can't implement a new idea every day, but it gets hard to keep track of everything. And so this process has impose disciplines on our own execution, right? So that we get up in the morning, we put together our quarterly plan and we live by that for a quarter and we adjust it. So if one of us comes in with a crazy idea in the morning, we go, well, is it in OPSP? Is it on the document? If it's not, should we be on the next one? Or But we go, this is our mission for this three months, right? So it's been really good at keeping us focused and we've gotten so much more done as opposed to just having a bunch of ideas, we actually complete those ideas now, which is kind of a novel approach. But true, it's all in the execution. And when you have a process that allows you to get to really fully executing, that's what makes it work. So would you say that using the scaling up principles and process helped you get through the pandemic? No, I think the pandemic drove us towards scaling up. So we actually, it was the beginning of 2020 that we went and visited, we went to, um, I don't know what you call it. Well, a CEO boot camp with Vern. We went down to there's a they got a little house in the Keys, had eight business leaders there, and we went through that process. And it was just this real wake up call. I'll just speak for myself. It was to be in a room with these other CEOs and made me feel inadequate, if I'm being completely honest. And I'm, I have stopped growing the way that I need to grow. And it just really challenged me. So from that perspective, yes. But we were so new into it at the beginning, at the beginning of the pandemic that I can't credit it exactly. Although we put together a plan and we stuck to it. <laughs> we, we hadn't done that very many times in the past. So I think the process has been really helpful for me personally. And I'm confident Chris feels the same way in our own personal development. It gets hard when you're at the top of an organization to figure out where you need to push yourself because people don't actually tell you all the time 
when you're a screw up. And so getting in a room with people who are in the same kind of role as you and being able that, that challenge you was super helpful. Did you say what the organization was? Align 5 is the organization that hosted the event. And they are coaches. We've hired an Align 5 coach to guide us through the OPSP and scaling up process. We're pretty good at running this business, but that's all that, you know, the disciplines around that are a whole other thing. And so we just felt like we would benefit from some coaching. And I think that was injecting that level of humility into ourselves. I think one of the key elements of leadership is figuring out how much you're not actually good at. Yes. And uh, being around others who perhaps have been through it. You may have been through something else you add to them and, and uh, somebody else has been through something you haven't been. It's very helpful. Oftentimes we're alone and you feel like you're on an island. So we use also the leadership team here in our pulse meetings, which is called the weekly pulse meeting. I don't know if you have the same thing in scaling up. So we use that as a, a time to go through that. So, all right. On to what we did for you. You're a client of ours, and thank you very much. You're a great client. We love to see that, that you're, you're successful. If I remember correctly, you bought the company out of bankruptcy. Is that do, do I remember that correctly? Yeah, actually, my business partner got hired prior to, and it wasn't really a bankruptcy. It's called an Article 9 UCC sale. But we came into the business when it was super debt-laden, had some bad management decisions. And we came in at relatively senior positions, but not CEOs. The business ultimately was through the TARP back in, what, 2011, I guess, through TARP. It was assets were seized and we found new investors to come in, buy the assets and continue the business. And so we took what was then about a $7 million go forward business that was losing two and a half million dollars a year and spent the next, I guess, four years turning it around and then growing it from that point. So we're $24 million business now, just finished our year, and um, we've got fairly aggressive growth plans going forward. That's an amazing turnaround, by the way. Amazing turnaround. So congratulations. Yeah. Good for you. Hard work. I know the work. I came out of a uh, came out of a family business that ended up in a receivership, very similar situation, and just getting it to a point where I needed to leave, but getting to the point was such hard work to make determinations of what to do next, and then started this company based on all the things I learned f from that business, what not to do, what to do, but. That's the way life works. You don't learn mostly from success. You learn from the failures. How much better are we at stress management today, right? I told my wife the other day, I said, right now, I said, I'm having a bad day. I was having a bad day. I go, I'm having a bad day. I said, I don't think you understand. I have seven things right now that would have most people in the corner trying to figure out, you know, <laughs> what am Crying. I doing? Yes, I know. And, and, and I'm just, I'm having a little bit of a bad day. I need a little, I'm going to need an evening to sort this out. Battle hardened. Um, You're battle hardened. A different kind of person after you go through that. And I wouldn't trade it for anything. To be honest, I really, like, I hated that time period, but I also loved it. And I wouldn't go back. I wouldn't take it away for anything. I get a certain amount of juice out of those stressful situations. That past experience did create that battle hardness. And uh, I like the juice that I get out of it. And I like to say, and I'm not quite sure who I'm quoting, but it's a quote. I didn't make this up. It's better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war. And I think that's what we are. You have to be a monster, right? Somebody else says that. You have to be a monster. It's easier to tame a monster. So um, that's what business takes. It takes that. Jeff, tell us a little bit what we did for you and what that looked like and how has it helped the business? So it's it's what you did and where you're going to go. I told Sonia when we started this, it's a, we tend to be pretty loyal. When we find somebody who is helpful and understands our business, we tend to stick with them. We have lots of plans for you going forward. The initial project was to integrate our Shopify stores with intact accounting system and with our vendors. So to automate all of that work, we were spending prior to this integration, we were spending anywhere from $15 to $30 per order. And our web orders tend to be $50 orders, right? And so we were to process those through our manual process was costing $15 to $30 per order. And you can see that's a loser, but we have to do that work because we have large clients, we do what we host all these sites for our larger clients. Well, 
you guys helped us put together an integration plan, which allows us to go through, and I haven't finalized my costing on that, but what I believe we brought the cost down to is about $1.50 per transaction. So it's just a real time saver. And we've, elim- we've alleviated a ton of work on our admin teams, on our production teams. We've improved profitability on all of that. And by the way, for the cost, you guys were able to accomplish it. And by the way, not just do that integration, because that was a critical component, but you also helped us migrate from Sage 50 to Sage. That's right. Yeah. To Sage Intact, you said. Right. To Sage Intact. And so that part to me is kind of just, oh yeah, and. (laughs) All right. Now it was probably the larger part of the work from your guys' perspective, but the cost implications of this integration were so important that that's really where I focused. But when I described to one of our business partners, what we paid to get that done. And we work in an industry where everybody wants to do that. They were like, and you did that in how long? And how much did it cost? So I tend to be a pretty demanding client. I don't know if Sonia's explained that to you. Believe it or not, she has not. Well, I can be a bit of a PETA. So I have very high expectations. I have a certain amount of technology background myself. And so I I know what I expect. I know what I think it should take. I No, I've often gotten into situations where everybody quotes something on the front end, then they want to do uh, time and materials. And that quote meant absolutely jack diddly as you go through it. And, you know, you've got five, 10 times the cost you started with. It's a year later. You still haven't implemented anything because nobody knows what they're talking about. And I expressed some of these concerns to Sonia prior to the engagement. And she said, listen, we haven't gone over budget in, I don't remember what the exact number is, but she assured me what I'm telling you, this is going to happen. I said, all right. I said, we're going to roll the dice. Well, it didn't happen. Nothing happens exactly as it's supposed to. But what I can tell you is that every step along the way, you've got a lot to be proud of. Your team stood by their original estimations where I said, listen, I think we dropped the ball here. You guys took care of it. If we dropped the ball, we took care of it. And so it's been a great working relationship. Probably the best, and I listen, I don't, I'm not given to hyperbole or compliments, but as long as we're talking, it's the first relationship I've had where I said, other than one I have in India, which is a now an eight-year relationship. This is the first relationship with a, a tech provider that is likely to continue. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That does my makes my heart happy. Number one, I'm a very lucky guy to have a wonderful team, and I'm so glad we're we're able to support you that way. Our biggest focus for you and every client is how can we make you better, and make sure we keep our promises. So I'm very happy. Thank you very much for those words. It's been a really good experience, and all the more when I told people what happened, and I wasn't absolutely thrilled with everything, and they're like, "Holy crap!" Like you did that. And so I go, okay, maybe I'm a little hard on myself. (laughs) (laughs) We have a lot more to do together, I think, because you and I have briefly chatted about a number of things to help you scale the business that technologies today that just simply weren't available even uh, six months ago. Things are changing so rapidly. All right. So now we get to a new little segment that we have, and we're going to ask you some questions that you have no idea what we're going to ask. I don't. No, you don't. Because um, I, I didn't even read Brian's list. Oh, <laughs> you didn't need to. But uh, these weren't on that. Hey, <laughs> Jeff. These are Nobody surprised. ever does, Jeff. Jeff Nobody I ever does. It's, 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 it's a it. common courtesy. Yeah, he sends it out. He talks about it like, oh, I got (laughs) We'll just, we'll spitball. All right. So I guess I'll start with the first question. You kind of touched on something. I'm going to go with, if you could turn back the time or the hands of time and talk to your 18-year-old self, what would you tell yourself? You know, I should have thought of this. That's a question that comes up on all this stuff, right? What would you tell your younger self? I've never really given it much thought. But as you ask, I would say, relax, you're not as smart as you think you are. Like, honestly, I, I, that's, I wish I knew earlier what I didn't know. I would have saved myself an awful lot of heartache. When you're trying to make your way in the world, this is my advice, right? When you're trying to make your way in the world, you think everything is competitive. You're always competing with somebody, which means you've always got to be better. You've always got to be pushing. You always have to be smarter, stronger, faster, whatever. But you're not. 
And sometimes you're just pretending. And if you focus on the things you're actually good at, if you spend some time figuring out what you're actually good at and focus there, you're going to just, you're not going to hit quite so many roadblocks. You'll hit roadblocks, but not quite so many. And you won't piss many people off on along the way either. Man, I pissed a lot of people off. Oh, gosh, I know. <laughs> so, you know, mine was a little more vulgar. If I was talking to myself, I would have said, shut the fuck up. Yeah. Oh, by the way, not bad advice at all for <laughs> Yeah. Two ears, one mouth. Listen more than you you speak. Um, yeah, gr- great stuff. I hey. can still use that advice if you want to just record <laughs> that for me every so often. I could too. So scribbling these being down. Recorded, huh? uh, who's next? <laughs> I'll go next. So Jeff, when it comes to uh, business jargon, there's all this business hullabaloo that's out there. What's like some business phrases, business jargon that just really grinds your gears, and you just wish to God it just fell off the face of the earth. Uh, by the way, you're going to hate this one. Okay. Innovation. I'm just, everybody's innovating. Everything, no, it's not innovative. That's not innovative. At best, it's evolutionary, right? We take too much stuff and we say, we're going to, we're going to innovate this. There are very few real innovators in the world. I'm not one. We're working inside of a fairly well-established sandbox. Do it better. Do it smarter. And 99% of innovators fail right? We're not out there. We're, we're not out there trying to invent a new category. We're trying to do it better and stronger, faster, right? Smarter, all that stuff. But uh, so innovation is mine. I'm just, I just think it's just such an overused under, under understood word. Yeah. And evolution is, is a uh, continuous improvement to me. So I agree with you and scaling up. I'm sure it's helped you do that. I know that EOS has done that for us is that we're a continuous improving company or improvement company. I don't believe in perfection. I don't believe it exists. So you... it's out there, right? It just will prevent you from getting anything done. If perfection is your goal, congratulations. You've got the next 30 years to figure out one task. Yeah, exactly. Hey, Allie, what you got, Minion? I wanted to ask you, Jeff, what would you like to be remembered for? I'd like to be remembered for creating opportunities for the people I had the pleasure to work with. I think as a business professional, as somebody, as a leader with a team, I want those people that that have chosen, and everybody chooses every day whether or not they get up and come to work. They have chosen to put their shoulder to the plow, the plow of field that I'm directing and I'm appreciative of that. And what I owe them in return is that their life is better as a result of having done that job with me. That's what I feel like I owe. And so I would like to be remembered for having done that. Hopefully I will have accomplished it and and people will look back and go, I'm glad I had the opportunity to work with Jeff. Well, from my impression is that you really care about the people that work with you and for you. I've gotten that from this podcast. So appreciate that. I, I definitely do. And by the way, we have, I think we work together. Like it's, this is our team. This is, you know, we very rarely call people employees, right? They are technically employees, but we're part of a team and a community. And we just happen to be in different positions in that community. We're not better or worse for those positions. Always oh, yells at me when I call him boss. So that makes sense. He does the same thing. Every time yeah. I call him boss, he yells at me. Yeah, no. I'm not your boss. You're not an employee. You're my colleague. We work together. We row together. We fight together. Get in the boat, baby. That's right. Grab a row. Get a yep. more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. So uh, before we sort of get ready to end this, what's up next for Club Colors? Anything on the roadmap that you want to tell the audience about? Reach. We have expanded our offering into social media, business-to-business content creation, and we've promoted uh, – John Morris, who was our director of sales previously to executive director of brand, and he's launching an initiative where we're helping companies really figure out how to navigate simple things like what you think is a LinkedIn profile and how do you connect with customers on LinkedIn? How do you create content? We have our own podcast in the club. And that whole thing is, is we're really getting a lot of traction, a lot of excitement from our customer base and people who follow the business around that activity. And there's a huge need. As business changes, there was a time when you just had to have a LinkedIn page. Now you need to know what to do with it. 
because that's people aren't picking up the phone as often, right? You've got to have a way of connecting with people. And by the way, the more people who do it, the more you will just be noise if you're doing it wrong, if you're doing it like everybody else. And so that initiative is very exciting. We have our design lab, which is much more of an agency component. It's the advisement on steroids, so to speak, where we're really bringing clients in to a space, working through their their marketing objectives, and then aligning everything really across the board with those objectives. So Design Lab is, is very creative on content, video, spatial branding, all kinds of print collateral, that kind of stuff. And then reach is the digital component, the, the social media component of that. So Jeff, tell us uh, how people get a hold of you at Club Colors. And so if they want to get a hold of you and do business with you and then all the remarkable things that you're doing. Well, they can get a hold of me. Uh, by the way, I'll tell you what, I'll do four things. My email address is jbalmay at clubcolors.com. My business partner's email address is ctossi at clubcolors.com. There's also connect at clubcolors.com, which is kind of will put you into the sales, the sales cycle. And then www.clubcolors.com is our website, explains what we do, kind of gives you a, an overview of services that we offer. That's terrific. Folks, you'd be dealing business with a man with a heart. I mean that because I work with him as a client, but he's a partner to me. And everything that these folks do, they really, really care. They care about your outcomes. So I would encourage you, get with them, find out how they can help you move forward in your business. Before we leave, you and I share musicians in our family. I have a son who's a Berkeley College of Music grad. He's out in LA trying to make a, a go at it, right? But I noticed that your wife, Nancy, appears to be a musician. What is she doing and uh, is she enjoying it? So she has, COVID has been terrible for her, by the way. That all, whole, all musicians. Oh my gosh, what a mess. So she moved on. Actually, she didn't move on. She has added a YouTube channel, Nancy Balmay, I think is, if you just search for Nancy Balmay, you'd find her stuff on YouTube. She's a wonderful singer, focuses primarily on 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s music. She's starting to do Olivia Newton-John. I am fortunate. I married a woman who looks like Olivia Newton-John, and now she's doing Olivia Newton-John songs. She John does song. look like a new, she does. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So yeah. she is, she's local primarily, does a lot of dinner shows, this kind of stuff. But she was doing 150 shows a year prior to COVID and then just got the wind knocked out of her with that whole thing. So, but she loves it. And we have like lots of music. My wife and I met, I was a songwriter in college. I wanted to go to Berkeley. I did. I, I didn't realize your son was at Berkeley. I wanted to go to Berkeley, but I was at a community college and met a woman. I, I mean, she was a woman at the time. She was probably 18, but I met a girl who was a better songwriter than me at a community college. And that's when I decided to scrap my plans to go to Berkeley. I'm like, if I can run into somebody who's better than me at Wabansi Community College, I probably don't belong at Berkeley. <laughs> Let's get into accounting. <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah, that's awesome. That, and I said, every musician I knew at the time was working at Pizza Hut. And I'm like, well, I know I want to eat something other than Pizza Hut. And I'd like to be able to support a wife at some point. So I probably ought to switch career choices. So that's what I did. Well, listen, uh, all musicians right now have struggled through the pandemic. I know firsthand having a son that's just focused on this. I did do my journalistic background check. So I did find her. And she's, uh, yeah, so, and I listened to the tunes. Uh, she doesn't honestly, I honestly love you by uh, Olivia Newton-John. She looks Looks like Olivia Newton-John. You can find her on YouTube at Nancy, B-A-U-M-E-T, Nancy Baumet. I've realized it's Baumet. So please take like a look at what she does. And uh, hey, Jeff, thank you very much for doing this with us today, for being an awesome partner. And uh, we're wishing you all the best. So folks, uh, thanks for being here today, listening to Growth Enablement. We're crazy about getting you to grow your businesses and scale. And that's what we will do. So you can find us wherever podcasts are found, Apple Music, what else? Uh, guys, Literally uh, everywhere. Everywhere. Okay, awesome. So thank you very much, everybody. Ali, Brian, thank you for your contributions, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to this episode of Growth Enablement Madness podcast. 
I also want to thank Divinio Podcast for this episode's production and distribution. Finally, thank you to Sam Ward for our musical introduction and outro. Be sure to check out all of our episodes wherever you listen to your podcasts, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and more. New episodes are available monthly and cover all important topics for growing and scaling your business. Until next time, this is Jim Ward signing off. Let's grow. Let's grow.